Well, with that, um, I wanted to go to the next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we are, oh, I have the control here. As I mentioned earlier, this is a look beneath the hood, but it wouldn't start unless we first anchor ourselves to our city council policy priorities, which we will um, speak to on day two more specifically, but uh, test against the operations and how um, we are able to advance these policy priorities. And so just for um, the record, we have six policy priorities. The first is to enhance economic and housing development, enhance community sports and recreational assets, enhance high quality efficient services and infrastructure, maintain adequate staffing levels, uh, enhance community engagement and transparency and compliance with Measure J and manage the Levi Stadium. In order to do that, any city manager, so we're going to go through some organizational development and some graphics here that help us with um, getting into the department presentations and add context. But um, as a city manager, it's important for me to outline first what my core services are and how I look at these policies and areas that are strategic to supporting the city council. Obviously, the first is supporting the council with policy development and strategic visioning. That's what our two days here is really about. The next is uh, fiscal management, and as I mentioned earlier, we immediately started with designing a 10-year budget forecast. I also want to acknowledge in your packet a new list that will be side-by-side -side with our budget process, and that's our unfunded projects list. It's important for us to keep front and center as many programs that we have funded, but also those that are, remain unfunded and to weigh against the importance and trade-offs of what we have to focus our time on going forward. Um, as city manager, I'm responsible for day-to-day -day operations, working with a very committed executive team, and we'll look at key projects and initiatives. As well as number four, which is important for me, and that's looking at our strategic ability to focus strategically on efficiencies, how we manage risk, as well as promote customer service. And I've heard that from the city council um, as part of its last session, um, and was delighted to um, bring this forward today. Um, and then also balancing our workload against council policy. What we'll hear today is uh, resource management, both by way of fiscal resources and our workforce is also as, as important as our ability to succeed in all of these six uh, strategic areas. So when we think about uh, the council's role and what the city council um, sees about the organization, oftentimes we use the iceberg and um, analogy and that off the council sees areas that are required for approval, policy development, and that um, when you look at it, about 10 to 20 percent of the organization services are often in front of the city council, which means that um, program mandates, implementation of laws, our legal obligations to our workforce, employee engagement, and just day-to-day -day operations are below the line, meaning 80 to 90 percent of our work um, the council never has a touch point with. And that's some of the areas that we'll share today. And how do we do that with, um, within our resources? It's important to acknowledge that we are a very integrated service. One department does not prop up a service by itself. It depends on multiple departments in order for it to be successful. And all of that is founded on the community and the city council's role and implement and advising us on which direction to go and what are the interests of the community as well as the city council. I do want to call out the role of the city manager and city attorney because um, in this structure, what's important to acknowledge is that everything has a touch point through either the city attorney's office or city manager's office, in that we are in every corner of the organization managing resources, working with departments on service delivery, efficiencies, or looking at areas of risk um, and transactions for service delivery. We'll see this new theme, I, and it appears as if it may have um, uh, been a, not as prominent in previous conversations, but it's important that when we talk about, for instance, looking at um, a theme here that will come out through all departments of hiring and staffing, it's important to look at the strength of our human resource department and how they're able to support other departments in the delivery of service and filling key vacancies. 
This is a slide that we'll refer to often, um, and it's a balanced policy approach. If we were in a public administration classes, um, slide would be front and center in discussions. Um, there's obviously the policy legislation work that the city council conducts at each of its meetings, and we'll look at workload increases. You'll hear some statistics in terms of how we've increased our investment of capacity in policy and legislation. Um, and then we'll also look at implementation and operations, and that's where staff takes the legislation or policy development by council and turns with its resources to implementing and advancing those. In some cases, we've done very well. In other cases, we won't be shy where we need to improve our services. And the last is one that I worry out loud about, um, and that's audit, review, and metrics and outcomes and our performance management process. Um, I won't be shy by saying that th there is um, a lack of focus in our organization, which means that as we pour resources into policy and legislation or implementation and operations, we don't have a checks and balance system within the organization that leads us to really understand the quality of our resource investments and whether we're getting the strongest outcome for our level of investment. And so this is an area that um, the city attorney and I have spoken about before that we really need to buff up on in order to make sure that we are efficient with our use of public funds and that we're managing well internally. So how do we do this? While this is a very large organization for the population um, compared, compared to other surrounding cities, it's important to recognize that we are highly operational in our delivery of service, and that's a good thing. That's what we're here for, to provide the public with services. I wanted to just um, walk through that this is our, our, um, our full-time equivalency. We, we tend to carry about 200 vacancies, um, and we'll definitely speak to that number later. But when we flow through, what we're really looking at is a very mighty, I'm looking at this management policy analyst in the bottom right hand corner, a very mighty group of about 100 management and, or analyst level people that are spread throughout the organization um, with different skill sets and areas of expertise that are carrying forward these incredible policy development or organizational changes that need to um, occur. And so we'll want to look at their capacity, their ability to be trained, their ability to maintain their skill sets, as well as their management grip on what they have to, to manage in order to advance the organization and the work that they maintain for the city. This is another organizational development chart that's important to acknowledge. The, the words are rather small because there's a lot of different bubbles, um, and they might be clear in your packet. Certainly on the website, if you see it blown up, you can look at the detail. But um, we've acknowledged early in past conversations that we really have three lines of business as the city of Santa Clara. We have the city itself, and it's a full service city with a broad range of services that you'll hear about over the next two days. We are unique in that we have our own electric utility, Silicon Valley Power, which distinguishes us from many surrounding jurisdictions, but also places a different service delivery model for the city to advance to, to stay competitive as well as strategic. And we have the Santa Clara Stadium Authority, which is also unique to the city with respect to its uh, governance structure and the services that are delivered through that authority. At any given time, when we think about our, our workforce, um, they ha if you imagine a, an employee in the middle, each of, those each of those bubbles are activated, and sometimes they're more pressing than others, um, and sometimes uh, there are work that must be done or that there's strategic planning on the end, but there are many drivers of workload for any individual or for any unit of work within the organization um, beyond the, the 10 to 20 percent that happens at the dais level. And it's important for us to understand that when we think about our capacity, um, that there are um, items of work or work generators that draw from the capacity that we need in order to be efficient with our delivery of services. I can name a few if I could read them, <laughs> but I won't pretend that I can see all the letters. They're in your packet, and certainly we can get back to them if, we, if the council would like to discuss this chart more. So the state of the organization within that context. 
I want to acknowledge, first of all, this is an incredibly resilient organization. And um, I have said out loud before that with greater levels of focus, there is an incredible amount of magic that I see this organization capable of. It has been through a tremendous amount of transition. One, onboarding the stadium authority, um, getting through a, a, a global recession, getting out of a global recession with an unprecedented amount of development and workload that comes our way. The fact that, um, that, that I have come to very clearly and unequivocally is the resilience of this organization is just, it's unmatched. Um, and that means that we are starting with a good set of foundation um, that we can only from here fine tune and, and allow for us to, to perform at an improved level uh, already within that context. Our staff is talented. They're committed to wor the workforce. They're high performing. They know that there are areas where we can improve. They've articulated those many times. They too want the investment and resources to become um, trained in areas that the public requires additional services or improved services. Um, there is, as I mentioned, there is an absence of time to fo focus strategically on enterprise-wide issues. We, um, with the drivers of workload, the number of items that we've already talked about, as well as our fiscal outlook, staff is very aware of, um, of those issues, and they have articulated that they too want to participate in the uh, continuous improvement. So they're eager to hear what happens today and to understand the path going forward. I use the term management grip, grip often, and that's important to acknowledge because in some areas of this organization, we lack a management grip. It's not, it's not unique to the City of Santa Clara organization. This is something that many local governments have struggled with while we continue to recover from our, our reductions in workload or staff through the recession and while the community continues to ask for higher level of services that are matched by either private sector turnaround times or areas that um, require high touch. This is important because it presents itself in some areas that we have not done as well. And I've mentioned them in um, different committees such as implementing new laws, um, projects that get started and go on the wayside or never come back to the council or that are delayed. We've talked some about some contracts. We'll go into greater detail later about um, the manual processes that we use in order to um, implement contracts management, council agenda production, or other customer relations management systems um, that just do not serve the city well and allow for us to maintain a management grip on what is it that we are um, trying to manage and getting good, good data from it. We've done well with building up the city's reserves. The council has been very disciplined with ensuring that it uh, adheres to its budget principles and invests back in reserves. Um, we've done well with more fully understanding our fiscal outlook, as well as in the packet presenting unfunded projects list. It's a good base to understand how we make decisions going forward and what the strategies related to those are. Like many organizations coming out of the recession, many projects were deferred, they were delayed, um, and suddenly now they become urgent all at once. While there is revenue coming in, as well as where systems or, or equipment are on their end of life cycle. And so those, what that means today is that we have many mission critical projects at either administratively from a capital perspective or just from seizing a strategic opportunity. And those happen all at once and we've, we've well acknowledged them all over the course of a couple of council meetings and some of them came up today from our public speakers. There is a tradition of effectiveness of being a model city and providing the services to the community and council. This is, a, this is something that has been anchored to very strongly. Um, there is a desire to maintain that model city status um, and getting organized around how is it that we continue with that tradition and continue to be effective. There's a strong desire to focus on quality service delivery, modernizing services, and increasing customer services, which also comes with the need for capacity to focus on how we do that. There are, like any other organization, there are a series of unanticipated initiatives that come our way that all of a sudden we have to uh, absorb. Um, they could either be at a federal level, at a state level, or at a local or regional level that set a new trend for us. And so we have to be able to carve out time to absorb unanticipated work 
that is strategic and, and that feeds into the sustainability of our organization. That's a new concept for this organization um, and something that we need to really practice as we go forward. The next one is, is we'll spend some time both um, through, the, through the PowerPoint presentations and as well as the city attorney will make um, some comments. Um, and this is looking under the hood in greater detail and bringing to you where we need to really focus on. We are um, in some key enterprise-wide functions. We are either over decentralized or they're just not present. Um, I am concerned about our procurement processes. They are, um, we have a key vacancy. Our, our manager recently retired. We have uh, many parts of the organization conducting procurement processes which if we were more centralized, we might get better economies of scale, we might get at more efficient pricing, um, we would certainly manage risk more better, and it is an area that I think um, from a process improvement is probably one of the highest priorities for this organization that departments too have spoken out as they would like some help in this area. Prevailing wage compliance. Um, this actually goes hand in hand with minimum wage, and I'm not. I won't be shy today because the council does need to hear some of the areas where we can do better. Um, these are one is a council policy, the minimum wage, prevailing wage is state law that recently came, and we have um, been under resourced in our management of these policies and our ability to implement them and sustain them. And what that means is that we've had some mistakes. And that we've, when we have these mistakes, we have to administratively go back and correct them. Um, and that concerns me because if these came out in my first three months by way of observation, it also means that we have other areas of risk that need to come and bubble up to the top so that we can work on those as well. And largely this is because we have an absence of a centralized risk management. Um, and I think we need to spend some time here uh, deliberating on how we cure this within the organization. Um, it would not be uncommon in this organization to not know the current status of where we are insured, for what levels, how we, who we go to for managing um, that type of risk within the organization. And who's thinking about risk when we implement a project, when we uh, do employee initiatives, uh, when we look at claims and things of that sort. We have touch points in this organization, but there is um, a common practice throughout other organizations where someone is really focused on risk management to um, promote safety, to promote the efficient use of uh, public funds, as well as to manage risk from um, other types of legal or um, or personal perspectives. Training and certifications. While we meet the needs of training requirements for positions, um, our level of certifications are decentralized. And so we, at no given point in time, could we query a, a system, because we have an absence of a system, of knowing where our employees are certified in their training and what's, their, what's the horizon for investing in these certifications to make sure they're renewed. Um, that's something that we should be concerned about because it's often something that our labor force looks at as in terms of wanting to be invested in so they too can promote services or um, from a risk management perspective, making sure that our employees are certified uh, uh, for the jobs that they perform. Um, accompanying that is our performance auditing. We have, um, to my knowledge, and I would challenge any other department director if I'm wrong, but I've, I've been here three months and I've said this many times before, we don't have anyone who's formally trained within the organization in auditing. Um, to look at our work at an organizational level from a pre-audit perspective in the event that we did happen to be audited, we, we meet all the financial standards of, of financial audit. So that's the good news. But when we look at ourselves from a performance management standpoint or a, through management reviews, as I looked at that diagram earlier, it's just not present, which means that um, we, we lack the absence of knowing um, where the risks are within the organization, whether we are continuously improving in a way that is um, matched to government standards and that allows for us to be prudent with our limited resources, um, and just continuous improvement all around. Um, and it's an area that I think is, is prominently important because I'm anxious to um, get use this as an investment 
towards looking at our fiscal outlook and how we yield additional resources just by improvements and looking at our work through a pre-audit status. I've already talked about the absence of a contract management system. It's all manual, um, and which means that we can't query um, or take advantage of competitive contract management or procurements. Um, that in other organizations, if we were more centralized, we would be able to say this organization is going out for tree trimming. Um, we have three or four contracts. Maybe if we do one, we can get it priced better. That's just one example. Intergovernmental relations. Um, I want to just be real clear on this. Um, we are a, at a key point in this region. We're strategically located. The, uh, the region operates as a region and, and has made some great advancements. But with this particular one, I would want to start with the basics. Um, I can cite, I, I think I'm up to three laws now where we were delayed in implementing or didn't see cri critical, critical moments where we could have um, provided advanced work so that the timing of our implementation was by far more strategic. And so this isn't um, just getting advancing legislation or working at a state and federal lobbyist perspective. That's probably a bell and whistle that we'd want to add later on. This is more keeping track of recent state laws and how we implement them expeditiously so that we too um, are in compliance with uh, and it, with a timely implementation of those. There's no central function within our organization for real estate or asset management. There isn't a database in the system where if we went and wanted to understand the terms of all of our deeds or what our real estate strategies are for the land that we own, um, it's just not present within our organization, which means that it's a collateral duty throughout this organization um, that I think we could be more strategic with and um, as we look at opportunities for land use um, that have already started to come up. I have already mentioned process improvements and um, some of our administrative processes are weak. Um, they've been before the council. We've had some, um, some articles that have come out that just do not serve our, our organization well and it's a function of training. This is what I'll use in this in this instance is um, our Public Records Act request. I'll, I have a metric for this later. Um, significant increase in Public Records Act request and an absence of training on how we uh, handle those as well as how we review them to maintain confidentiality um, and, and properly produce the records that the public requests. All of that being said is that the last um, bullet is we can do this. I know we can. There's, these are issues that are not uncommon to other organizations, um, but I don't think they've ever surfaced And as we look through going forward on, on strategic areas to serve the organization um, better and, and in turn serve our public. What I'd like to propose is that we look at additional workload and the state of the organization through the lens of how policy and operation priorities align to our budget timing as well as um, unanticipated workload that we know is, is forever coming. So the next area that I'll cover is our support for council. And this is another core service that I had raised earlier as, um, as uh, for a city manager. Um, there is a commitment from staff and the city. There's a lot of deep interest in being more strategic. There is a significant increase in legislative meetings. Um, council's work has been impacted by either being deferred or delayed, um, and so that's always something that we struggle with and that we continue to want to serve the council well, um, and for lack of capacity, we've ha had to delay or defer, which then in turn um, can upset the council with feeling that we're not implementing or advancing your strategies. There have been some true administrative failures on our part, um, and we can talk about them later throughout the, the sessions where our own training, our own administrative processes have not upheld to the standard that the public as well as the council deserves. Um, this is an, the next bullet is an area that I do want to touch on and there's no formal workload review process. And so we never come back for, as an um, enterprise to our board to say this is how we're doing on what the council has asked for. This is what you asked and directed us to do and you're holding us accountable through our, our frequent reporting of our work and our progress of it. Um, pacing the organization is something that I think has um, been prominently discussed and how we um, continue with the strategic nature of our work but at the same time look at how we pace ourselves within our capacity. Um, and on 
there's a strong desire for improved trust and relations, and staff strongly wants to meet the council's needs and share barriers for success, which we'll begin today. Long-term strategic planning. Um, the 10-year fiscal outlook will serve us well. It will be the foundation for how we make decisions. Um, I add here that without strong fiscal management, nothing else is possible. And so this is really where um, we begin our work as we look at our, our fiscal situation and how we um, begin to um, fine tune it going forward. There are an incredible amount of strategic land use opportunities underway which position the city well for balanced growth as well as strong policy development. Our business operations require the same level of strategic diligence um, and there are some significant services that are absent which I've already walked through. Um, we'll also hear through our IT presentations that we just have some outdated systems that um, never make it above the 10 to 20% line um, and that we have to continue to invest in them and carve out the work so that we can sustain our service delivery. Um, and again, with the mentioning the strategic vision and innovation, it is very strong here amongst the organization as well as the council. Um, clearly, the resilience is very present and everybody wants to align to one vision and how we move forward. Um, I'll walk through the um, operational workload metrics absent. I, I had a running joke here with some of the um, executive staff here that uh, I was waiting for the week when someone was bringing in a data-driven decision to me and I would say it out loud and you know we acknowledge that um, data and our around performance it wasn't as strong as we could be until finally one of our directors last week walked in all of the data and supported decision making and I was very pleased with that. Um, and so the, the three-month run is, is, is gone as of last week, but that's a good sign coming, meaning that um, that comment has been heard. I've mentioned information requests. It's, um, this is, I just want to quantify it because the, the PRAs as well as information inquiries, they are increasing. Oftentimes the, what this means is most PRAs have to go through the manager's office or the attorney's office for risk management. There's confidential emails. Um, that by law can remain confidential, which means that when we're working on a dozen PRA requests at once that often have thousands of records that we need to review, that's what our time is being consumed on. And it's often Brian and his staff or um, staff sitting at this table. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that um, while we are implementing the law, it is a capacity um, driver in our organization. Um, the other is that we, are, we have not had systems in place that allow for us to respond more quickly. We don't have a software system like an e-discovery software or public records where we can respond to them and then put them up on a city's, our website. So if a member of the public is requesting something similar in nature, it may prevent a Public Records Act because the documents are already available in our previous response. Um, we all we do this manually within the organization where if um, if we do have a thousand records we have to go through the records individually to determine what it what may, must remain confidential what's responsive and what's non-responsive um, and I think we can do better um, if we looked at a, P, a public records act system as well as when we get to a records management system we will we will be in better shape but for now this is a manual process that we have to continue to respond to. I think I've already mentioned this um, uh, about the manual processes, but I'll continue to use this as another area where I think we can make some strategic investments. Um, I mentioned this my first week at a Rotary luncheon where um, I was fascinated by the fact that we were absent a customer relationship management system, which means that um, there are several Excel documents throughout the organization where we're manually tracking what are the inquiries that our customers and our, our public are asking of us to overcome, meaning a lot of um, points of entry, a lot of um, tracking confusion, and a lot of um, manual maintenance, and in the process still trying to get the work done that, for which what the community member is asking for <laughs> while we're trying to keep track of all the different um, inquiries coming in. Um, there is our easy customer relationship management systems out there that through our new website development, perhaps that's an opportunity to connect into and invest some IT resources in. This is one where um, we talk, if we look at the balanced um, 
uh, chart where we had the arrows. I think it's important to note that we have increased the, within an effort to increase transparency and to stay on top of policy development and managing the organization, our council meetings have increased by about 40% over the years. But that too has had a workload impact with staff in terms of keeping the reports written and policy development moving. Um, and also then with the absence of the um, auditing or the management reviews, it, it, there is a missing part of our puzzle here that is worth examining, which may be driving this number up uh, for purposes of management and oversight. We looked at our committees to understand where we're focused our time. We also found that there is a 60% increase in uh, just the sample that you have there of committee meetings. Um, which is a redirection of our capacity and also an area where we would want to look at in terms of the value add and are there opportunities here where some of that capacity can be um, invested in uh, some of the absent areas of service that I've already surfaced. Um, boards and commissions, same way there are, there's, you know, this is a highly active community and that's a good thing. And I, I'm always impressed with um, the level of participation on the part of our, our community and the um, high number of activity that occurs at each of these um, at each of these opportunities to engage. It is a, a resource contribution and we'll want to test against that in terms of um, how is it that we ensure management grip um, drivers of workload through our commissions as well as what that means for our capacity. Number of new policy issues. Um, this is just a top of mind um, list of items that have come up over the last three months. Obviously, the council knows much more about um, the, the last couple of years of other additional items. We'll touch on these, um, but these are areas that we want to be able to focus on and serve the public well, um, but do need to initiate um, a pacing or a work plan process so that we can deliver on the areas that the council has already directed. Probably um, some of our more strategic opportunities are upcoming ballot initiatives. You'll hear about our council um, district election work plan um, over the next two council meetings and some um, milestones that we just have to mit hit in order to meet the June timeframe. You'll also hear on, um, as early as next Tuesday, a workshop on can our cannabis program and what we want, what the areas that we want input from the city council. But this is also an area that in order to regulate and to look at revenue opportunities, there are some key milestones that will follow that we have to hit for November, um, which will require our focus. Um, and then I just mentioned some others that we are watching to see how that may impact other ballot initiatives, such as the swim center or recreation investment in our parks and rec um, uh, infrastructure as part of we, our process going forward related to ballot initiatives. Large scale development. Um, we will spend a couple of slides later in day two going through City Place because this is um, a new, obviously, a new development with the breakthrough of our settlement agreements. Um, we will have to mobilize very quickly. I would already argue that we're behind in that. Um, we, there are some key staff positions that we need to begin to recruit for. There are some contracts that we need to issue, which in this organization can take three to six months. Um, that we'll need to get in place so that we are resourced in order to deliver very tight turnarounds in the development agreement um, that the City Place project calls for. There are other strategic opportunities res with respect to land use that we'll want to advance with the Council and that really position the City well, but they will take our, our keen focus and our ability to dedicate the capacity to. I just, I know that the downtown revitalization has come up. We're prepared to actually begin closed session discussions um, because we have a limited number of council members that um, that are um, not conflicted on this item. We will be scheduling separate closed sessions on separate dates, um, but there there has been some um, some good movement that shows a lot of promise and that um, to the point where we are ready to prepare for closed session discussions and action. So I know that's come up, and I just I want to acknowledge that there has been some. Um, good work over the last month or so on that. Employee relations, of course, without our workforce, this is all not possible, but we have 
a number of open tables almost on an ongoing basis just looking at our MOU schedule which also requires a lot of focus and a lot of um, high touch with respect to staying on on top of these and knowing what our employees really want through by way of MOUs and employee relations um, and so we have five open tables right now and um, it is an area that will continue over the next couple of months um, so that we can uh, bring these to closure. Community engagement, uh, we launched and you received, a, we put on our website and you received a memorandum and you'll also on January 30th um, get a full presentation from our consultants, but we did launch the Stadium Authority um, com robust community engagement process starting with a polling for baseline data, um, which is already underway. And we'll be, um, over the next couple of months, we'll be heavily involved in this workload, as well as other areas where we have been more focused on enhanced community engagement, such as Open City Hall, and new approaches to social media, as well as um, engagement opportunities out, in, out with our community. So we are active on multiple fronts. We are um, always looking for what's the value add whenever we engage or contribute capacity to new endeavors so that our resources are used strategically. Um, and it will continue to be an issue, particularly in that when we look at our 10 years, any new initiatives that we take on without new revenue that accompanies that, we are in a deficit spending mode. And I'd like to use that same analogy that whenever we are looking at new initiatives with our workforce, we are also in a def uh, deficit spending mode to the extent that we don't um, better pace ourselves or schedule um, items out so that um, we can absorb them over time. So with that, I'm going to ask Angie to come up. We'll start our 10-year presentation. Are we, I'm just checking, I want to do a check and I know we've been talking for a while. Are, are we ready to move on or? Yes, I think so. Okay. <laughs> All right, so in this instance, and, um, Angie's going to walk us through our fiscal outlook. I'm going to walk her the, um, the PowerPoint changer. You're going to do it for me. And um, don't be surprised if Walter and I just chime in on some of our findings as we've been working as a team to um, put this fiscal outlook in place. So this is great. I don't think we've had a 10-year presentation before. So. No, we haven't. And yes. it's important for us to understand our fiscal outlook as we think through Agreed. where the areas where we got to go Thank to. You. So good morning. I'm used to saying good, or good evening, so it's a little awkward. So I'll have to look at mine. It's a little hard to see on this. Um, this um, you know, the city has uh, city council has been wise. We built up our reserves. We're actually over on all of our reserve targets, which is great. And you'll see a, a slide on that later. Um, we've had um, significant progress with the ten-year fiscal plan. This was something new to both um, myself and my staff. So um, everyone worked together, and we've been able to put a preliminary one uh, together. So we'll be also going over that. Um, We've been able to see the pension cost because we have Bartell uh, and Associates do an actuarial for us. And I will tell you that he was uh, almost right on target with um, the 1819 numbers. So when we had him do those, um, we compared them. It was just, it was off maybe 1%. So, and that was really good. And we do have, um, you know, revenue sources that do have some volatility. And, you know, we depend on three major uh, sell, or major taxes for the general fund, which is sales tax, uh, TOT, transit occupancy tax, and property tax. And then we have, um, you know, the liabilities for the other post-employment benefits. I will say that we do have a good plan. You know, our um, underfunded liability here is about $45 million, but we do have a funding plan where we're paying that off over 22 years. So, so that's good. And that was something that was put in place before I actually started, so that, that was good. We do have, um, as the city manager had mentioned, a lot of unfunded infrastructure, and we will be adding more into the current budget. So I will kind of, um, some of my slides will show you what was in the 1718 budget, but we're in the process of working on the 1819, so, so you'll see additional unfunded projects there because we've had some assessment studies done. Um, the need for a strategic plan on revenue opportunities and expenditure management. We need to look and see are there areas where we can increase uh, revenues. And, you know, a lot, I've been told, you know, our business licenses are very low. That would mean that we'd have to do a ballot measure. We need to have those discussions. 
um, tax reform impacts are not fully understood. So I just wanted to show you what you've already seen. This was from our budget um, for 17-18, but just kind of a refresher. So you can see that our citywide annual operating budget at that time is, was $729.1 million, uh, with $219.1 million in the general fund. And this is a general fund appropriations by type, the 219.1 million. You can see that 78% of our cost rests in salaries and benefits. And this is something, again, that I had uh, discussed with the council and the public when we did our study sessions. So I just wanted to say that even when we look at services and supplies, that only makes up 17% of our budget. So. On the fiscal outlook, this chart shows you that sales tax, the trend has been slightly lower than we had projected, but it's still our highest. You can see it makes up 27% of our revenue, and it's, it's a volatile. Um, our sales tax is our most volatile. Property tax is stable, and it is increasing. Obviously, the cost of housing um, has an impact on our property tax. And then uh, TOT is trending uh, just a straight line, so it's been very stable but very flat. Again, as I mentioned, the three highest um, are property tax or revenues for the general fund are the TOT, sales tax, and property tax. They make up 59% of our revenues of $131 million. On the sales tax, again, it's the largest general fund source. And with business to business sales making up almost half of our sales tax. So, so that's really important. If there's any downturn, that would, that would really impact our sales tax. And there's also some volatility, obviously, in the TOT. You know, if there's an economic downturn, that would impact this revenue. We do have challenges, and we've mentioned those, you know, over and over. I think um, the biggest one being the rising pension cost. Um, you know, we're managing three impacted categories, which are retirees, classic members, and then the PEPRA members. Um, CalPERS actions lowering this discount rate from 7.5 to 7% is having a huge impact on um, our budgets and uh, on other cities in the area too, what just statewide actually. The new 10-year fiscal plan will, um, using the cities, as I mentioned, the actuarial Bartel and Associates, um, PERS rates provides a structure for fiscal management. We can see what those costs are and we can manage around it and try to solve our budgets each year. And then we're trying to see these rising pension costs. Can we absorb them in any projected revenue growth? So this was a slide also that I had um, done for the five years. So you can see that the rising pension costs, they're, going, they're projected to increase by $32 million by 22-23. Obviously, when we do the 10-year, we'll have a better projection of what those costs are going to be. Um, the rates will peak at 49.6 for the miscellaneous group in 25-26, and for safety, it will be 76.5% in fiscal year 30-31. And what that means in, um, for people is that for every dollar, we will be paying 60 or 76.5 cents for safety, and for uh, miscellaneous, it'll be almost half. So. So you can see where the arrow is. I wanted to call out that's where we peak. And then you'll see that the PERS will go. I mean, obviously, it's still going to be high, and then, um, but it's going to start trending down. And that's because the full impact of all the um, you know, different changes that PERS has put into place hits at that time. Um, if something else happens, obviously, this trend line will, um, will change. You know, PERS has been talking about they don't think 7% is low enough. So if something were to happen, then that would change. Safety, you know, they're not even, their peak is not even showing on our graph here, our 10-year graph. So it won't show until 3031. And I put it up in the square that it'll be 76.5. So we did set up a pension trust, which um, was uh, you know, very proactive on the city's part. We've been able to fund it $15.5 million. We have an unfunded liability, you can see at the bottom, of $464.7 million. Um, 
So this year we will, um, when we're working on the budget, come up with, you can see where the circle is, we're going to come up with a funding strategy so that all funds are actually contributing to this pension trust. And then as far as the percentage of unfunded liability, that's how we um, calculated it for electric. We wanted uh, the general fund and electric to be on the same ratio, so they're at both at 4%. So we'll come up with a percentage for all the funds. So, so again, our fiscal challenges, this is also the OPEB, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have the unfunded liability of $45.2 million. We're currently 25.9% funded. We do have a funding strategy to pay this off. And we are paying the actuarially determined contribution, which means that when we have the actuarial, they tell us what we should be paying to fund this over, over the 22 years. Um, GASB statement 75 does require this to be reported on our financial statements, so you'll be seeing this as a liability in the next uh, financial statements, the 17-18 the financial statements. And here's a slide to show you um, on the reserves. You can see our working capital reserve. We're actually going to ask to change this to budget, I believe, budget stabilization reserve. Or Budget, yeah. budget stabilization reserve. Yeah, it, because working capital and capital projects gets a little confusing for not only the public but staff because we're like, okay, well, what are we doing? Where is that? So the working capital is the 25% uh, or 90 days of appropriations. So um, our 25% would be 51 million, and we currently have 55.5 million dollars in there. And you know, we want to be able to use this along with the pension trust to help us get through some of these hard times. Uh, capital projects reserves are what are used for the uh, capital projects that are funded specifically from the general fund. The five, it's a five million reserve target, and as you can see, we have 32.6 million dollars. Um, but I will say that that's still not enough to fund the projects that we currently have in our five year. So, um, so we'll have to be really looking at that in this uh, 18. Uh, 19 budget. Angie, can I just interrupt you? Sure. We we highlighted this because in your packet under a separate tab is unfunded projects, mm -hmm. and these when you if you just toggle over to that page, you will see a, a list of items that um, either need to be replaced or improved or or invested in, and we'll want to have that policy discussion because. Um, ideally, coming up with master plans or plans to of what the assessments are of these facilities, some of which that work has already been done, we can then start to work with the council of level of investment and financial strategies over time. These aren't things that will go away, and um, we'll need to start to revisit them so that we can start to um, address them over the next couple of years. Do we have an amount on those unfunded projects? No, in, in fact, okay. what, um, what we'll start with is we should start with some presentations with the council and understand from the council, once we have these uh, facility assessments or capital project assessments, what the level of investment would be from the council. So it will be up to further conversation for us to decide what those amounts are. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, we also have the building inspection reserve, which is about 8.9 or 8.8 uh, million dollars, and that is restricted for development. It's um, a development rated related costs, building division costs, and then land sale reserve. So this is from sale of city owned land, and we have 39.3 uh, million dollars. So we have a total of 136.3 million dollars sitting in reserves, which is really good. Again, we'll go back to um, what what the city manager was speaking about and funded projects and infrastructure. We we don't have an, an funding strategy right now for short or long term needs, and then we have them in these three categories: public facilities and other infrastructure, streets and other infrastructures, and parks and rec. So here's just a few. I items under public facilities and other infrastructure that we have um, looming out there, that we have the civic center repair, we have the corporation yard, fire stations, uh, convention center, and cemetery. Under streets, we have um, the pump stations, storm drains, annual street maintenance, as you re may remember from a study session we had last year, we were not even able to fund the minimum to get to our um, PC. PCI. PCI. Okay. <laughs> um, and we have major street improvements and then trails and bike lane improvements. 
And then Parks and Rec, we have the International Swim Center, which is a big one that's sitting out there in sports facilities, fields, and land acquisition. So I'll, I'll transfer over to what we've put together for the 10-year plan. I want to just highlight that this 10-year does not include any, um, th uh, any a recession or economic downturn, and it also does not include uh, any revenue from uh, re the city place. I just wanted to show you what we had seen for the five year so that it's familiar to everybody. Um, this is what we had presented at the time. The only thing I did include for 1617, I updated that to show you the budget surplus that we were able to um, have at the end of the year and fund our um, reserves. So at that time, we were looking in, um, see, I have to put my glasses on. In 1718, we were looking at an 8.5 deficit. 1819. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, 1819. This, this font is little, and I'm getting old. <laughs> So we were able by putting the actual PERS rates and in revising some revenue projections that we felt like based on the surpluses that we were getting in the previous years that we may have been a little too conservative. So we revised some of those revenue um, projections and salary projections. Uh, we were able to take that 8.5, and I'm just looking at the 18, 19 year for, for reference. We were able to bring that down to $5 million, which was really, really good. Um, I, I keep in mind also none of these projections include the five uh, employee groups that are in negotiations right now. We, we have not included anything because there's not anything that has been determined. So what we did here is now we've reduced the 1819 to one million dollars and how we did that was we said we will fund our working capital budget stabilization reserves and capital reserves with surpluses. Um, yeah, one-time sources that probably at the end of the year we'll see where we have, just like we've done, um, what we we're able to do with the 1617 when we had the, the surpluses. So we think $1 million is, pro is manageable. We'll, we, we think we can, but again, just keep in mind that that doesn't include any of the negotiations that we have going, ongoing. So this slide right here shows you how if we self-solve, and what that means is if in 1819 we solve the 1 million, that 1 million will be solved through the 10 years. So you can see in the next year, we're in the light pink salmon color, we're saying, okay, that 1 million we've solved, we solved that in 1819, so now the, the red is a little smaller, and then the same thing, same effect in each year. So we're saying in each year we actually solved that year before, and so it does look like, you know, you obviously still have to solve for those, but uh, we will be looking to try to do that and hopefully um, we'll get to that green. Andrea, I just, I wanted to make some additional comments. What's sure. important here, and, and I'll say the same thing that Andy, Angie just said in a different term, is um, in the previous five-year forecast, we weren't giving ourselves credit for solving the previous year's deficit. And so what the light colors show is giving ourselves credit for solving the problem and then what the net um, deficit is that we'll have to solve. What's important here is you can obviously see the growing numbers in 2021 um, and how, um, how enormous they can be. But if you look at the next two fiscal years and the magnitude of the city's budget as well as other revenue opportunities that are on the horizon, What's, what I would say to you on this, the good news is the next two years are extremely important for us to focus on the city's fiscal management and look at revenue opportunities, in-house efficiencies where we can um, better improve our use of resources so that we prepare ourselves for the out years. Um, and I want to continue to, to focus on this going forward because there's... Um, opportunities for the November ballot where we can further stabilize ourselves. There's opportunities with City Place that we can further stabilize. And anything that I've already raised about efficiencies um, as well as new revenue opportunities that we can we can track. I think we can do this and, and can, if we've accomplished this within our first three months of really fine tuning um, our projected deficit from 8.6 million to 1 million, 
if we had a deliberate focus and more time like the next two years, I really think we could get a management grip on the out years. It doesn't mean that there won't be reductions. It just means that we will know where they need to be. We can engage with our employees and engage with the public so that we all move forward together and that these next two years are critical for us. Thank you. Sorry, Angie. No, that, no that's great. So the next slide, so you can see where the, we're saying we're going to self-solve. So I took that out here. So here's where we would, if we solve all of the, um, the deficits for the prior year, self-solve, you can see that these are the areas that we need to actually focus even more and give more attention, as the city manager had said. You can see that one spike, I believe it's in 2021, and that's when the full impact of the PERS from the 7.5 to 7% because they're doing it over three years. That's why you all, all of a sudden have a huge dip right there. And then when we go, um, when you see the little spike in the green, um, that's because we, the way PERS does it, we have different amortization bases in PERS, and so one of our bases, the nine, it was nine years and it falls off at that time. So um, that gave us a little bit more of a bump too. We just kind of wanted to show you how, um, you know, as I said, I have not projected any type of economic downturn, but you can see that just based on the slide, it goes up and down, and we are on the upward. So, just this is more just for everyone to just be aware that it does go up and down. Those there are um, downturns, and we probably are going to have one in the next ten years. So potential impacts to this forecast. Again, I mentioned we are in uh, labor negotiations, and those have not been uh, assumed in this uh, tenure yet. Um, CalPERS actual actuarial changes. If they make any more changes, this will impact us. Infrastructure operating budget impacts and regional and state economy. You know, if, if something happens, um, beyond our control. Further refi refinement of major tax revenue projections. We'll still be looking at uh, our sales tax, our property tax, and TOT, and making sure that we are um, more on line with those projections. And then um, development projects, such as City Place, is out there. So we wanted to go over our, our budget work plan. We already are in the process of working on our 2018-19 budget. Um, so we actually had our kickoff last week. Um, we will be, um, I'll go over each one of the budget approach, the capital improvement plan, annual operating and the stadium authority operating debt service and capital budget. For the 2017 or 18-19 budget approach for the, um, the overall budget, we're positioning the city for potential economic slowdown through um, prudent management of our reserves. And that was the, when I went over the reserve slide showing you that we have put more than our targets, which are good. We're, we're getting set for that. Manage project cost escalations by holding some projects for a more uh, favorable bidding climate. Revenue uh, projections will be re reflective of historical trends. You know, in the past, when I was looking at the five-year, uh, we just used flat percentages. We weren't really looking at what, what has been the historical. So we will be going and looking at that and trying to be, um, as I said, more on target there. Managing changes in total compensation, specifically salary and pension. We'll be looking at new revenue sources. Um, is there a community benefit programs, a review of current taxes, including TOT and business license tax, Resi review of fees and charges um, to get to full costs where appropriate, uh, consideration of potential new or, or modernization of impact fees, and other rev revenue generating opportunities. So what we are um, proposing, and I, I believe it's one of the recommendations um, for this meetings or these next two days is to adopt a two-year CIP budget this year and then rotating in the operating to a two-year in the next year. This would help us as far as aligning staff. Yeah, um, staff actually has to stop. We start um, preparing the budget actually in December and January. We're getting so, so we have five months of where people can implement and then they have to stop and actually start um, working on t uh, two budget documents which are very uh, extensive or very time consuming. So we'd like to align staff and as we mentioned, be more strategic, be more analytical. And we feel like if we could do that, we could, we could have, um, it would be a better uh, document that we're presenting to the council and the public. 
um, we've asked the departments to make sure that when we are doing the CIP to actually make sure the second year of their budget, um, their CIP projects are as accurate as possible. We would prefer not to have to come back in, in between years and ask for more money or say that the scope has changed. So we ask them to be as, as uh, accurate. Incorporates, incorporates city council priorities to in, illustrate fiscal investment and alignment. Review existing projects for funding level and priority. Close projects that have been open for a long time that have no activity. So that's been um, one thing that we've really asked departments to look at. Focus on completing projects that were approved in prior capital budgets. Um, add, address any health and safety issues and any serious deferred maintenance needs. And budget decisions will be made with long-term impl implementations taking into account um, using data from this 10-year financial plan that we're putting together. Um, a, a big one is align staff capacity to complete the projects. And then the second year, of the C as we had mentioned, should be as accurate. I think we duplicated ourselves, but we want to make sure that <laughs> that's a big one. <laughs> Um, there's a limited amount of general fund capital reserves, as we had, had said, and how um, you know, when you're looking at especially unfunded um, or deferred infrastructure projects. So we've already said that we, are, we don't have enough to even do the projects that are in the five year. So now we need to realign and see how, what can we do with that money and then how much of the deferred projects we can do. Projects that departments are saving for over several years, we've asked them to change their funding source. Uh, to reserves. We have uh, departments that have a project maybe out five or six years, so they have budget uh, basically saving to do that project, which is great because you want to put that money aside. But it overinflates our CIP budget. It looks like we have a huge CIP budget when really that project is not active yet. Uh, departments are to provide unfunded and deferred projects just like they did last year. And the CIP budget will be re revised to move towards budgeting by project and not by funding source. I'm not sure um, if you're aware, but currently, I always use the pavement management program. We have a gas tax fund, a traffic mitigation fund, and a streets fund in our budget. And, and uh, pavement management is in each one of those. What we want to move to is have pavement management program with different funding sources so that when the public looks and says how much are we spending on streets they have to go to one project and they can see the full cost so so it'll be hopefully we'll condense the document and make it easier for everyone to read um, project descriptions should be accurate and funds should match to the actual work being performed for the annual operating budget we want to incorporate the city council priorities um, budget decisions will be made with, again, like the CIP, with long-term implications taken into account using the 10-year plan. Address gaps in staffing. Um, as the city manager had mentioned, we have gaps in risk management, contracts, sustainability, real estate, um, purchasing, or procurement. Continue community engagement and transparency efforts. Limited number of personnel, new vehicle requests will be considered. And to look at improving your business processes. And um, this, even if it requires the use of one-time funds, if it improves and, and lowers the cost going forward, bring those forward. And we've asked the departments to do that. We're no longer beginning with a status quo budget. In the past, we've just said you have your status quo, and then you give us your funding request. Finance will be reviewing those uh, to see if money is actually being spent. Can we absorb some of these requests that they, they need to do? So, um, so finance will be working on that. Um, requests should only be made for projects that are items that can be completed or are well underway in 2018-19. We've asked departments not to request money if you're not going to do the work. So um, use of other funds before use of the general fund. This is something that we always try to do. We're just trying to make sure that the departments are, are really being um, you know, very analytical about this. So if there's other funding sources, let's use those before general fund. And then all budgets will be scrutinized regardless of the funding source. So on the stadium authority budget, again, this is one of the items that we've already begun working on. Uh, my staff has started putting the template together. We've had meetings with Manco to start receiving all the documents. Um, we are in the process of incorporating the audit recommendations for the, uh, from the Harvey Rose <coughs> Measure J audit. And 
uh, wanted to give you a preliminary. This year, for the first time, we'll also be having a study session. We've never had a study session on the stadium authority budget, so we um, have that set for February 27th with a tentative date to adopt on March 13th, and then if we need further discussion and, and adoption, March 27th. And this is our preliminary calendar for, um, for the city's budget. Uh, adoption of the principles on um, January 20th, and you can see the first public hearing and uh, adoption of the municipal fee schedule will be April 17th. We'll have a joint study session for the CIP on May 8th and the operating and 10-year financial plan May 22nd. I will try to have the 10-year earlier than that, but this is where we're putting it for now. And then on June 12th, we will have a, a public hearing on the bud both the uh, operating and the CIP and the 10-year, and then we'll go for adoption on June 26th. Thank you, Angie. So the next part before we get into the department presentations is just a review of our human resources, the status of our workforce, and what trends we want to share with the City Council today. Um, part of what Angie surfaced is some new concepts with respect to managing our fiscal resources that we'll want to talk with the Council tomorrow because while well, Angie said that we launched the budget last week, we actually launched it this week. It just feels like last week. But, um, but it is timely in that how we manage going forward with some of these concepts stabilizes our organization for goal setting and the project delivery that we have to hit very importantly over the next couple of months. So um, I wanted to just start with some high-level observations of the status of our workforce. And it's for you to think through how that integrates into goal setting and our ability to um, address the many different items and initiatives underway. So um, the good news is, if we, are, the numbers are, I can't even read the numbers from here, I apologize. Um, and it looks like the percents may be wrong, but the good news, 162 of our employees are eligible for retire, and the remaining 816 are not. So that's some good news in terms of um, how we, what the state of our workforce is. The key thing here then is what programs we have in place to retain them and keep them well trained so that we continue on a trend of committed service with high quality um, service delivery. We're in a competitive market like no other. It's well acknowledged with our lower than average unemployment rate throughout the region. And so retaining employees is key to us, as well as attracting wherever there's vacancies that are critical for us to fill. This is um, uh, a story that you may not have heard, but when we looked at the trend line of number of recruitments, it's obviously going up. Um, part of because some folks have left the organization either by being recruited out of the city or retiring. And what is also important to look at when we look at the number of recruitments against our staffing levels, which have stayed pretty flat within HR, the applications are also going up, which means that when we look at our workload through HR, you'll hear a lot about this throughout many department presentations, we have a higher number of vacancies and because we are a civil service organization, we have a higher number of applications to go through to filter through those that meet minimum qualification. That means that um, by way of volume, the workload has pretty much increased on both um, number of recruitments as well as applications. Retirement eligibility, when you look throughout the organization, I look at this and I've, I've seen other organizations where there's a higher number of retirees that are eligible retire eligible employees for retirement. Um, again, it gets to the story that I said earlier, how we retain them um, as well as how when an employee does leave the organization because of retirement, how we transfer over that institutional knowledge is something that we need to work through. Um, institutional knowledge and organizations that have gone through significant um, transition is really important for us to understand context and moving forward. Um, this is a chart that speaks to um, we're in good shape from this perspective, but we have to be mindful about um, managing our employees that are with us and, and keeping them on board. We looked at some turnover. Um, you know, this is a pretty low number given that um, our, our high number of employees. 
but we do want to understand um, what, why employees decide to leave the organization. Um, we know that there's other job opportunities or relocation tends to be the trends that are um, allowing for employees to, to leave the organization. And so when there are other job opportunities, we'll really want to test whether um, it's for lack of competitiveness on our part. Employee separations, this has more to do with um, issues of retirement, um, which it seems to be mostly driven by. Um, some of that we can't control. Um, but again, when retirements do occur, it's important to um, build an institutional knowledge and in the transfer of. New hires and promotions. This is important when you look at how we're trending. We're, we're increasing with new hires and promotional opportunities. And when I see this, what this speaks to me is, is that as new people enter the organization, it's important for them to spend the time getting up to speed, the, a learning curve, if you will, on what, what is important, what are the importance and values of the organization, how the organization runs, and just learn the service delivery models of the organization um, so that they're successful in the workplace. What it also means is that when, because of the higher number of promotions, we do need to allow those employees that internally get promoted to also learn how they do their, their job. They may need specific training. Um, they may need leadership um, awareness or training or supervisorial training. Um, as we continue to promote internally, we want to make sure that we treat those employees with the training that they need to be successful as well. Um, it's part of retaining staff so that staff knows that um, we value their, their commitment to the organization and we want to help them be successful when they have the opportunity to promote. Um, this is more data in how we're trending with new hires. Um, if you notice, many of them are coming through the professional or, or non-sworn category, which just underscores the importance of the institutional transfer of knowledge as well as acclimating them within the organization. Here's just some data around promotions that um, more information to study as, as we consider making our employees successful as they're promoted internally. And from here, we'll get into more detail around departments, and I'll invite Liz and the, actually, I'll invite, there's no seats, but maybe the cluster.